everyone. Um, I'm very excited to talk to you about proximity matching with random forests today. Um, I'll quickly introduce myself. My name is Anna. I work at Lendable, a little fintech startup company, um, and we represent, uh, so to say, the link between alternative lenders in Eastern Sub-Saharan Africa and investors in the US or Europe. And um, we help to uh, kind of our alternative lenders, our customers, to grow in a reliable and fast way. Um, and we do that by purchasing part of their portfolio that could be uh, micro loans or asset backed loans with like motorbikes or solar panels and stuff like that. And um, we use R heavily um, for portfolio managing and portfolio monitoring as well as to predict default rates or cash flows with our risk engine. Um, so um, after we, we purchased our portfolio, we have a, like a, we maintain our ongoing relationship with our clients and we have like monthly meetings where we talk about the current portfolio performance and things like that. And a big thing um, that where we heavily use R in is to monitor performances. Um, and so one major thing is to look at do they still care about our portfolio um, that we have purchased versus the other kind of part of the portfolio that we have not purchased. Um, the problem, what, this is like a randomly chosen graph from, from this kind of monitoring thing. Um, and uh, so in this case, the green one is the not purchased portfolio and the yellow one is the purchased portfolio. And if that, if, if that would be repayment rates, we would be a little bit concerned by the swap, kind of the normal portfolio, so to say, is doing kind of averagely fine and the other one kind of drops. Oh, sorry, the other way around. Um, nevertheless, um, the problem with this comparison is uh, when we look into a deal, into purchasing a portfolio, uh, we have a like a very extensive catalog of criteria um, due to legal or investment rules and things that I'm not that able to talk about because I don't know them all. Um, but so um, when we purchase a portfolio, there are there's a lot kind of selection going on. So this, this comparison is biased by those selection filters. And there are multiple ways um, to solve for this, for this biasness. Um, and um, one of them is proximity matching with random forest. Spoiler alert. Um, and um, I will walk you through an example with lend, uh, um, lending club data. Um, this is uh, online available. They do like uh, a very similar thing. Um, it's an online platform and you can um, get a personal loan for yourself or your business and they connect you with investors and they have a huge data set online available and I use that um, to kind of walk you for an example. Um, so first of all, we create our chosen purchase portfolio by using uh, variable filters. Um, so for example, we look, uh, we only want to kind of collect, choose something b between um, certain interest rates um, and uh, zip codes and, and uh, amounts and grades and what, what not just in there. Um, so in this case, I know exactly what those filters are. Um, in some cases, I don't know exactly what those filters are and or uh, the data is not available. Um, or it's not collected um, in an ongoing way. Um, so if we compare now our purchase portfolio, our chosen portfolio, to the rest of the portfolio, we can see significant uh, differences in characteristics. Uh, in this case, it's the loan amount, right? I mean, we filtered on the loan amount, so we kind of expected that, but just to kind of keep the example going. Um, as well as uh, with the zip code distribution, there is like a huge difference here, um, indicating that a raw comparison is like unfair to say the least. So if we would look at like default rates or number of um, uh, loans that are still active or have fully paid, um, we should know now that it's it's biased. There are selection filters going on here that um, we should think about um, what to do. So the question is, how can we eliminate those selection filters? Um, 
to, to put that in another question, uh, the thing that we want to have at the end of the day um, is we want a, a similar group, right? Uh, we want to find, kind of find all those inheritance filters, um, those selection filters that lead to kind of our chosen portfolio. Um, and the key word here is similarity, um, which kind of pops up uh, a more or less obvious solution <laughs> um, to use proximity scores from when the forests. And um, quickly, what is a random forest? A random forest is an ensemble learner. It uses bootstrap samples and random feature selection, and it consists of multiple decision trees. Um, a decision tree here, represented in R, um, is a, a classification algorithm. It also can do linear regression. Um, and it starts by looking at all the um, available feature variables and kind of tries to split um, each um, variable into two groups such that it can label the resulting observation set. So in this case, we want to kind of label um, uh, our chosen and, and not chosen portfolio. Um, and um, you may not be surprised if we use interest rate and loan amount, our former used filters. Um, it can split uh, those, um, the, those observations up into the other portfolio and our chosen portfolio, here labeled by other and portfolio. Um, and a tree uh, really is, if you want to kind of visualize that in a two-dimensional space, that's really easy to do. Um, it's fe a feature space partitioning, right? So first we had um, the split between the, in the, in the low amount, so we had one group to this other, and the other one needed a little bit more work to kind of split it in distinguishable groups. Um, you may notice that there, is, uh, there are a few green dots in the big blue square. Um, uh, some, so kind of the splitting in, in decision trees happens um, either until you have a um, kind of sufficient number of observations in your end nodes. There are other stopping rules. Um, sometimes you want to kind of grow it fully. So to say it's that you have like um, very, very clean um, end results, like end leaves, we call it. Um, and this is this, this kind of um, those green dots within the blue um, is, is one major key point. From a tree to a forest, you put multiple trees together, you have a forest. Um, the randomness in, in the forest comes from two different uh, parts. First of all, each tree is based on a bootstrap sample. So um, usually a sample that is as big as the original data set, but randomly chosen. And you can show that then like around two thirds of the entire data set um, are in each bootstrap, bootstrap sample if you set replacement to true. So you're kind of drawing and kind of putting back again. And the other part of the randomness comes from randomly um, cho uh, cho uh, choosing uh, feature, selection, uh, feature variables. So, oh cool. So in each split, um, when you decide whether or not to kind of what, what variable would be best to kind of distinguish between group A and group B, you not have all the variables available, but only a random um, subset of the variables, which kind of brings other, another uh, randomness into the whole tree. Um, the reason to do that, I forgot to mention that earlier, is that um, trees very much suffer from over overfitting. And they're very, very sensitive to like really, really small changes of data. And uh, kind of putting all these trees together with random feature variable selection and bootstrap samples kind of helps with that overfitting. It's kind of the whole part of why we use ensemble learners. Um, so what does that mean now for our observations? Um, so imagine each tree has its own bootstrap sample. Um, each observation might be in multiple trees, not in all of them. And at each kind of uh, select, uh, kind of crossing, we have other features available to perform the split. Um, and so uh, observation A might end up labeled as orange in one tree and as apple in the other. And kind of going through for multiple trees, how do we combine all those 
kind of labels at the end, we usually take the majority vote. So each tree labels each observation and the label kind of in the end of, of each observation is then the majority vote of all the trees. Um, uh, so what that means is um, based on certain features and certain characteristics, um, observations can be considered similar or very, very different, right? If I if I look into into this room, there's a person we probably all have seen or used R, so we are very similar in that kind of field. Um, other may have used a lot of Python in the past, others may not, so there's a, like a difference in there. And um, if we look at um, a feature, the characteristic of have you used or seen R, you would end up in the in the same kind of labeled group. Um, if we look at the characteristic of have you used or seen Python, it may look a little bit different for various kind of examples in that room. Um, and so kind of this similarity um, measure is built in into Random Forest and Leo Breiman, who um, um, kind of created the Random Forest algorithm, um, mentioned that uh, the proximity scores that I will introduce quickly um, are one of the most useful tools within a random forest. And proximity scores basically count if observation A and observation B end up in the same end node, so in the, in the same end group, they can be considered similar for that specific tree. And this proximity score is then um, raised by one each time that happens. And we can normalize that measure um, by the number of trees to get like a normalized between zero and one measure. And this measure of distance has three main advantages. It's a metric free. Um, you can run the random forest in a supervised way to kind of backward engineering your selection rules. Um, and it does not suffer from the curse of dimension. So whatever kind of number of variables you have, put them in there, random forest will be fine to some extent. Um, take a look at uh, the proximity matrix. I have here observations A, B, C, D, and E. And uh, the upper one is the normalized one and the, and the uh, matrix at the bottom is the one where we actually count how many times two observations ended up in the same end note. Please note the diagonal has always has to be one or like the number of trees. Um, and so for example, um, observation B and observation E did not end up in the same end node ever. While observation, um, let's take D and observation E ended up in the same end node five times. Observation A and observation D ended up in the same end node 165 times. So out of A, B, C, D, and E, well, actually B, C, D, and E, A can be considered most similar to observation D if we, if we kind of use that similarity measurement. Um, so how does it work? I can now use that measurement, those proximity scores from a random forest to create my so-called control group, right? The treatment group here would be my purchase portfolio, my, my chosen portfolio. And I want to find all those observation in the rest of it that can be considered most similar to have a fair comparison. Um, so this is the code. You can run the random forest supervised or unsupervised. Um, then you uh, have all those indices that mark whatever is in your portfolio already. Um, then you take the proximity matrix um, and uh, delete all the columns for the in-group indices uh, or IDs and select rows only for those, such that you can find for each in-group observation um, the one from the other outside group which has the highest proximity score. And Maybe you remember um, the main reason that we kind of wanted to do that is first of all to find another group that can be considered similar based on the characteristics that we're looking at, as well as um, to kind of backward engineer our selection rules, which we may not know all the time. Um, so we had the zip code and the loan amount, and after proximity matching, 
it's a lot better, which was kind of ho the whole point of it. Um, and when we look at the zip code, I split them to kind of see it a little bit better. We had those huge spikes, right? Because we actually selected like various, very specific zip codes. But the kind of overall distribution from what's left of it um, is like way more similar than before. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention is why do we even kind of do that? Um, why don't we just use the same filters and kind of apply it to the kind of outside group. Uh, one problem with that is they might not be available anymore. Um, and so we really have to look at what can be considered most similar. So if we look now at a, at a comparison and, and like whatever performance measure we want, want to use, um, we know now that the difference are not based on the selection filters anymore. And um, when we compare that, for example, to a, run, a randomly um, a sampled portfolio to kind of as a control group, um, we can see that uh, the characteristics are much more similar with the proximity matching. So what about Lenable? What about our original problem? Um, so we had this comparison, this raw comparison before, and we actually know it's unfair because we know that our criteria are very, very specific sometimes. Um, and also from a quality perspective, um, which kind of lays behind that. After proximity matching, this looks uh, much different, first of all, and we can now be sure that the difference in those performance metrics are, are not due to selection filters anymore, which was the whole point of it. So now we can have like a very a much better basis to compare different performance metrics and to kind of actually talk about um, for example, this was the original uh, empirical distribution from a feature variable, um, and after proximity matching, it looks much better. Um, yeah, and that's that's it. Thank you very much.